I think that I'm able to speak for my mom and my dad that one of the things they love most is when my family comes together for a meal. When everybody gets together, we're all in the living room, and it, it doesn't even have to be a fancy meal. It could be pizza, it could be burgers, it could be a barbecue, it could be my mom's pasta, or my mom's, you know, like that, that meal that we can only get with mom. It doesn't have to be anything fancy, but there's just something about gathering together people that you love for a meal. If you think about it, how much of our culture and the customs in our culture deal with a meal and gathering for a meal. Think of all the restaurants. We've got fast meals and fast food and happy meals and fancy meals and we've got meal plans and all of this revolves around a meal. Probably our nation's biggest holiday is Thanksgiving and if we think about it, it's this big celebration where everybody comes together for a meal and Thanksgiving and it's largely the same. We have turkey, we have stuffing, just for the record, no fruit and stuffing. Grapes do not belong in stuffing. But the greatest Thanksgiving meal ever, it wasn't so elaborate. And the night before he died, Jesus gathered his friends around him and he took bread and he blessed it and he broke it. He handed it to them and they took that bread and they ate. This, this is a Thanksgiving feast. And welcome to Jesus and the Dead Sea Scrolls. I'm Father Dave Pavanka. I'm president of Franciscan University of Steubenville. Uh, once again, I'm joined with Dr. John Bergsma, a theology professor and also the author of the book that we've had a great time uh, discussing, Jesus and the Dead Sea Scrolls, Revealing the Jewish Roots of Christianity. Um, last time we talked a lot about baptism and just the, the role of the Essene community and purification, but it's not just baptism that we find uh, that was important to them. They actually had some kind of a Eucharist. They did. They did. You know, Eucharist means Thanksgiving, and uh, we call it, you know, it's our great meal of Thanksgiving to God. And on a daily basis uh, around noon, you know, after they had dressed in white robes, and as we mentioned before, uh, bathed in Hold the on to the white robes because it comes in late. It's important yeah, later. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Those white linen robes, they'd wear those and, and they would dunk themselves to purify. And then the historian of the time, uh, this man that we've mentioned before, Josephus, he describes them going into uh, an apartment of their own, uh, very, very likely an, uh, an upper room even, uh, where they would uh, gather around and, um, and uh, set themselves down in a very a worshipful manner, a liturgical manner. And then a priest would officiate, and he would bless the bread, and he would bless the wine. No one could partake before the priest had done that. And then they sat by rank, uh, you know, by their, their seniority within the community, all around the table. And then they would partake of this uh, bread and wine. Perhaps some other dish might be included as they had availability. And they would celebrate this, uh, and, it, and they began and they ended with Psalms of Thanksgiving. And we even have their hymn book. <laughs> we have so all these the scrolls. Is the song? It is. Yeah, it's called the Chodayot in Hebrew, but it's the, it's the um, the hymns of Thanksgiving. That's really cool. And this is what they used. To, now those were not psalms. Uh, they were they were new psalms. Okay. They were um, Hebrew poetry written in the psalm tradition, written in the tradition of David, but okay. not you know not biblical, but new compositions. You know the, the idea of sing a new song to the Lord. Was during that time, was there any scripture used, Isaiah, or was it during the sacred meals? It was just those psalms, those, those prayers of thanksgiving rejoicing. Yeah, as, okay. as far as we know, we did, they, they, there's no record of them reading scripture during the meal, okay. but, uh, but they okay. began and ended with these... Uh, announcements? <laughs> I don't know. No announcements. There's the, well, there's the passing of the plate, of course. That's uh, of course. necessary to Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely, if we're going to have you, Chris. Um, so that's really cool. So this sacred meal, um, did they consider it sacred? 
I, they did. They did. They went through a long initiation process of uh, up to three years where... Wait, wait. So yes. somebody couldn't just come? No, no. This is, this is only those who were fully initiated into the, into the community. Um, so you, you began by just associating yourselves with the community. You might think of being a postulant, so to speak. Right. And uh, then you showed your fidelity for a certain period of time, and then they would admit you to the baptismal pools or to the washings, and you'd participate in the washings, but not the food yet. And just for clarity, is this still only men? This is, yeah, as far as we know, this, okay. is, this is still only men. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, and then you were admitted first to the bread and, and then ultimately to the wine as well, and then you're a full participant in the meal. At that point, you were a full member of the new covenant. Uh, because they believed that uh, they were living in the fulfillment of uh, Jeremiah 31, verses 31 through 34, that promise of a new covenant. So not everybody was invited? Well, not everybody could come to the meal. Not everybody could come, okay. no. Okay. You had went through a, pr uh, a procedure of initiation, and then having been washed and gone through the other uh, initiations and taken the oath, then you were admitted uh, to the meal. And if you sinned against the community, you could get excommunicated. You, and that was the primary form of punishment within the community. If you lied, if you cheated, if you stole, uh, your participation in the daily meal was uh, cut off to varying degrees. And again, it's, it's what we've been talked about. We've been talked, that's good, isn't it? I, let you know. <laughs> I, I actually have a doctorate. Uh, it's, it's interesting that so many of the things that I was hoping we would be able to get to is, is you doing such a great job, and that is to help us see the connections that what we do and what we believe today didn't just come out of nothing. And you've used a reference a couple of times in the Middle Ages, right? So I got an idea, but we find, that's why the title of the book, right? Gives us an insight. The Dead Sea Scrolls help us to understand why we do what we do today and what we believe today. Indeed, yeah. We believe that, you know, as Augustine said, the new is in the old uh, concealed and the old is in the new revealed. Well. If the new is really concealed in the old, we would expect that men that were praying over those Old Testament scriptures would see where the new was going, where the gospel would go. And I really think these SE men were an example of that. They meditated and they, they were able, through the lead, leading of the Holy Spirit, to organize themselves in a way that anticipated how salvation history was going to go. That's so cool. And you, you talk about how the Dead Sea Scrolls help us actually and give insight to Jesus's Last Supper, that, that what Indeed. took place there that we can actually learn more from what the Dead Sea Scrolls showed us. Sure. So we see uh, our Lord gathering the apostles uh, into an upper room, you know, no one else there, just our Lord and uh, the apostles. Uh, we see Jesus acting as the priest of the meal. This is very important. No one was to, to touch the bread or the wine before the priest had blessed it. But we see our Lord functioning in that priestly role there at the Last Supper and teaching the apostles to be priests as well and how to bless the wine and how to bless the bread. And that's how it would have been perceived by our Lord's contemporaries as a priestly act uh, at the Last Supper. Uh, we see that uh, famous altercation where the apostles are jockeying for position and yeah. arguing about. But there was a reason for that. It wasn't just their vanity, but they were trying to follow this custom of sitting by rank when you participated in the sacred meal. Have you mentioned that? Yeah, yeah. And, and we see our Lord uh, speaking of the new covenant. You know, he says uh, over the cup, according to Luke 22, 20, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which means consisting of my blood. So this is the meal of the new covenant, which is promised by Jeremiah 700 years prior. Now they're living in the fulfillment. Uh, just as Moses had a meal with the tribes, the 12 tribes at Mount Sinai, now Jesus, the new Moses, is having a meal with the 12 apostles on Mount Zion. You know, so we're entering into this new age. And you use the word new several times, new with uh, Moses and Deuteronomy and here. What did Jesus do that was new, that was different? Was there anything about that meal that would have been, kind of took them by surprise, that was different? The newest thing was that he was making these elements of bread and wine into his own body. Amen. And that was something that only is only hinted at if you have the eyes to see it. If you go back to Isaiah and Isaiah 42 and Isaiah 49, in both those place, in both those chapters speak of the servant being given as a covenant okay. 
to the people. That's the, the closest hint that we have that in, in God's good time, the Messiah is going to become the covenant. He's going to become the covenantal meal. And so Jesus is doing that. Nobody saw it. You can kind of see it in hindsight in those passages of Isaiah, but nobody expected that the Messiah would make himself into the food of the meal of the new covenant. And this is truly new. But, you know, it, it, it's a beautiful representation of what a covenant is. A covenant is a family bond created by an oath. And what better oath ritual to use then than to actually give one's body and blood to the people with whom you're making this oath and bringing into your family. You are what you eat. We take the body and blood of the Messiah into us. We become his body and blood. That's why you talk about the mystical body of Christ. You know, we really become united to Christ in this Eucharist. Okay, so if the Essene community is doing this every day, mm -hmm. we, we see some influence in, in what Jesus is doing or similarities between that. Would, just help clarity, would the Essene community, would, when they were there, would they stay, were they stuck in the, in the monastery or could they go out? Well, the, the men that lived uh, down at Qumran were probably sedentary. They're, they're, okay. They were stable there. Okay. Um, they probably didn't move around too much. However, every city of um, Israel had an Essene community. Okay, that's it. what I was going to get to. Yeah. So Jesus, yeah. would, would it have been possible that Jesus would have participated in or seen or been a part of or knowing people that was doing the sacred meal with the Essene community? Yes. Okay. He probably grew up rubbing shoulders with people that were participating in this because okay. there was a very widespread sect all throughout Israel. Okay, so another question. Jesus, we celebrate his Last Supper. Would he have done this? this type of a meal other times with his disciples? He could have earlier in his ministry. Of course, this had a special weight because exactly. it was also a Passover. Exactly. And that had a, a, a deeper theological dimension to it as well. So were there uh, other similarities between the uh, Qumran sacred meal and the Last Supper? Yes. You know, one of the interesting things is that you know, the, the Dead Sea Scrolls helped to, us to explain this odd phrase that our Lord uses in the celebration of the Last Supper, that the, the cup is poured out for many in Latin, pro multis, people might recognize that. Mm -hmm. When we look in the scrolls, this term, the many, uh, was a, a common term for the community, the community of the new covenant. So when we look at the Last Supper, the, the, the cup of our Lord being poured out for the forgiveness of sins for many, that's a reference to the church. It's, it's for all those who will receive the gospel and enter into this mystical body of Christ that our Lord is forming, uh, uh, have this supper as uh, the means of their forgiveness of sin. Okay. So that in itself, it's fascinating. You know, and, and there's, there's other uh, dimensions as well. You know, growing up as a Protestant father, I, I never saw you know, what, what you might call the liturgical or the priestly dimension of the Last Supper, you know, what we called communion. Um, but uh, we already mentioned our Lord functioning as a priest uh, as, as he does that. He also says, do this in remembrance of me. Modern readers forget that there was actually a remembrance sacrifice that was offered in the temple that served to renew the covenant between God's people and himself. And you can actually translate that phrase in the Gospels, do this as my remembrance sacrifice. So this was really, a, a, again, a priestly act, a liturgical act that our Lord was modeling for the apostles. And he goes on to say, you know, as my father covenanted a kingdom to me, so I covenant one to you there in Luke 22, verse 30. Through this meal, he's forming a covenant, but also establishing a kingdom, a kingdom that's manifested in okay. the church to this day. Okay, and that's what I want to get at, that there was a difference between that and the establishment of the covenant than merely a remembering which the Essene community might have been doing. Exactly. That's accurate? Okay. Yes. Okay. So our Lord is establishing a kingdom. This is a, you know, he's establishing a covenant. Um, this is no, you know, we often had the idea as Protestants of just, you know, this, this is a meal that we, well, we eat this wafer and we drink this little cup of wine and it comes around these big trays and, and we think about Jesus. Yeah, you know, yeah. we, we, we remember what he did for us. Well, that's great. You know, that, that's good so far as it goes. But, you know, for the, for the Israelites, this idea of remembrance was much more vivid than just recalling something that took place in the past. It was really reenacting and making it present in, in the current moment. All right, and we are going to get back to that. Yes. Sounds good. All right, stick with us.
Okay, John, so we've been talking about uh, the Last Supper, the Eucharist, this sacred meal for the Essene community, but you know, obviously you go to Mass. Your studying of the Dead Sea Scrolls has helped you understand things that we maybe weren't aware of or didn't recognize that's taking place in the Mass or that took place in the, in the, at the Last Supper. What would be some of those other things that, that sure. you saw? Sure. Yeah, well, from the, the very introduction to the Last Supper, when our Lord gives the instructions to John and Peter uh, to go uh, into the city and follow a man carrying a jar of water, uh, and he will show you this room that will be prepared. Um, we don't think very much about that when we think, oh, there must have been many men carrying jars of water, but then actually no, because if we recall, you know, ancient culture carrying water is typically women's work, especially jars of water. So that actually would be kind of odd to find a man carrying a jar of water. So again, for us, that's not a big deal, but it's somebody big who big heard deal. that, they would have thought they would have meant something specific, uh, a man carrying water. A man carrying a jar of water. Why would a man be carrying a jar of water? Most men have daughters or wives to carry water for them. Okay. A man carrying a jar of water apparently doesn't have any women folk in his community uh, to do this work, and he's doing it for himself. Yeah. yeah. That would probably be a male community. Who among the Jews know, lived in I male know, community? I know, I know. <laughs> See where that's going. Yeah. So this suggests to us that Jesus probably celebrated the Last Supper in the Essene neighborhood of Jerusalem. There's other archaeological evidence that suggests this. The traditional site is close to what we believe to be the Essene Gate, where they came and entered in, and left the city. So there's corroboratory evidence there. And it, it also just makes sense because leading up to the Last Supper, we're told in the Gospels that both the Pharisees and the Sadducees were trying to kill Jesus. So is he going to celebrate the Last Supper in their neighborhoods? Okay, probably not. They go to Chicago. Yeah, exactly. Uh, you know, but the Essenes are, are they're pacifists and, and, and he had a, it seems to have a good relationship with them. So I think he, he celebrated with them. You know, also the Essene connection may give us an explanation for how uh, Matthew, Mark, and John seem to describe uh, the Last Supper as taking place on Passover, whereas John seems to place Passover on what we know of as Holy Saturday. You know, so what's the, there seems to be a couple day discrepancy between John and the other Gospels on this. Um, I don't want to dwell too much on this, Father, but um, the Essenes operated on a different liturgical calendar where Passover fell earlier on the week. And uh, I believe that's really what's going on there, that um, our Lord celebrated the Last Supper with them according to their older calendar, and then later was crucified on the eve of Passover by the temple calendar, which was different. You also make re reference to the room, the upper room, the guest room, that that would have been something that the Essene community had? Indeed. They practiced charity and uh, were known for it uh, in, uh, the, uh, in the Jewish community. Um, they maintained guest rooms for um, taking in orphans or the homeless and so on. Uh, so th this, this idea of going to the Essene community and asking for this guest room that might be available would be very much in keeping with the kind of uh, works of mercy that the Essenes sponsored uh, throughout the land of Judea. Mm. So if uh, we're going to go back like we always did, so what? All right, so th those are some really cool connections, but what does that say to us today that, that go is going to Mass on Sunday, and, and, and how might this bring it more alive or make it more real or make it more, more um, an opportunity encounter of conversion and encountering Christ? Yeah, I, I think that, you know, again, growing up as a Protestant, just like uh, our view of baptism was this external sign of my faith in Christ, we have basically the same view of the Lord's Supper as well. So I take this bread and I take this wine, and it's just symbolic, you know, uh, for my faith in Jesus and that I'm somehow united to him. Um, but in light of the scrolls, when we, when we look at the celebration of the Last Supper, we see it's so much more than just uh, some kind of symbolic act uh, to represent my connection with Jesus, you know. This is, this is Jesus' priesthood going on here. This is a new covenant meal. I mean, again, Father, they were waiting 700 <laughs> years for the new covenant. And now the, the God-man gathers together his apostles and says, this cup is the new covenant Not a in symbol. my blood. Not a, Not a symbol. symbol. 
consisting of my blood. You know, it's going to communicate this new covenant to you. Again, uh, you know, Isaiah 42 and 49, the servant is becoming, he's being given as a covenant to the people there. So, you know, we need to remember that when we go to Mass on Sunday, we are participating in a fulfillment of a, of a prophetic promise that was old and ancient even in the time of Christ uh, and now has been, you know, been realized in our presence. Um, and we're, we're living in this end time that had been promised, that, that, that the Essenes were waiting for as well. In their, um, in their writings, in, in, uh, in their rule of the community, and in a little appendix called the rule of the congregation, they describe how uh, when the Messiahs, remember we're talking about those right. two Messiahs, when those Messiahs came, they were going to celebrate this meal of bread and wine with them, and they were going to sit in the kingdom of God and sit by rank and enjoy this meal. And, you know, when we gather for Mass, we're really experiencing this fulfillment that they were looking forward to. Right, right. And, and this, you touched on the idea of remembering that it's not just this, again, an intellectual exercise that we go back and we remember, but what's taking place in the Eucharist is, is, is that's making it present to us. That, mm -hmm. that it's not merely, as you stated, thinking about something that happened, but being able to participate in that yeah. as well. And there's a deep sense, I believe, in all uh, Christian believers that we can encounter Christ in the present moment just as really uh, as in his earthly ministry. I, you know, I, growing up, we attended many Baptist churches, and one of the characteristic features of that worship was the altar call. Mm -hmm. And one of the kind of tropes or, or, or standard uh, preaching phrases was, um, uh, come down and meet Jesus right here at the foot of the cross, you know. And literally what the pastor usually meant by the foot of the cross was to come down to the, you know, to the, to the head of the room the, of, the, of the sanctuary where there might be a table or an altar or something like that. And, and that was the foot of the cross. But what, what those Baptist preachers was communicating was something like our understanding of the real presence that in a mystical way, you can come down to the front of the church and, it, and Jesus is as real there as if you were with Mary and John at the foot of the cross. Uh, so it, it comes close to, you know, it, it's that Christian instinct coming out that we can encounter Jesus in the, in, in the real moment. The, the fulfillment of that is Catholic doctrine, the Catholic doctrine of the real presence, that he truly becomes present body, blood, soul, and divinity there. Uh, when we come down and, and we can receive him in that moment. And, 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 and the, the distance of historical time and the distance of historical, uh, of, of space, you know, of however many thousands of miles it is to the land of Israel, that means nothing. We can be joined as intimately as that with Jesus. Yeah. And um, what, what do you think is the, the, the thing that, that, that prohibits that, that blocks that, doesn't allow some studies say that Fewer and fewer Catholics actually believe what you just said and believe in the real presence and believe that Jesus body, body, soul, and divinity. Why, why do you suppose that is? What's, what's going on now that we seem to be having such a crisis in faith? You know, I think it's many, you know, uh, currents in our culture. It's this kind of uh, scientism and, uh, you know, well, that's not scientific, blah, blah, blah. Actually, Father, you study, you know, the cutting edge science is, is actually describing a, a non-local universe you know, that particles can, can instantaneously affect each other, separated by light years, you know, in, in space. And we're, we're really discovering that the world is, uh, the, 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 the physical universe is much more weirder <laughs> than we imagined, but it really provides an opening for faith. I mean, th these are things that we believe by faith that, that tradition has taught us, that we can be intimately united with Christ no matter how many thousands of miles we might be separated. And even yeah. science, in a yeah. sense, confirms that uh, in these days. So I think you know, it's, it's these, these different uh, cultural uh, patterns and also kind of a, a failure in our, um, our Eucharistic devotion in the past couple of generations, mm -hmm. uh, taking that tabernacle out of the center of the church and putting it off to the side, maybe not fostering things like Eucharistic adoration. You know, thankfully for practicing Catholics, I think a lot of those things are coming back. We're going back to trying to have, you know, perpetual adoration in mm -hmm. parishes. Mm -hmm. And uh, these core beliefs need to be uh, reinforced by our daily and weekly habits. 
um, because they are they are a connection with the living God. Yeah, I and, and we'll go talk more about this in the future. But there's there's this connection. I don't know this weird connection. I think I have to the to the community to the seeing community who desired more, who mm -hmm. wanted more, and they were willing to separate themselves. They were willing to live in a manner. They were willing to live by a rule. They were willing to sacrifice and go without in order to encounter that more. And, and the thought of them gathering in the middle of the day and, and having this sacred meal, mm -hmm. you know, understanding that there's something about this that was, that was different, that, that it was an encounter with mystery and with something bigger than themselves that takes them out of. Mm -hmm. And that's what happens in the Eucharist, is that I think each human person is created with the desire to encounter the holy, um, the transcendent, the mysterious, the beautiful, Mm -hmm. and, and this is what the Eucharist is inviting us to. Uh, I think that part of that is that we, we've lived in a world that's so busy and so crazy that we just kind of make the Eucharist one thing of many things that have to be done rather than the focal point. Mm -hmm. An image that I've used uh, many times over the years is, is Tarzan going through the jungle, but holding on to this vine and this next vine that I get to is the Eucharist today and then the Eucharist tomorrow that just keeps me moving, the, the grace and the blessing that is in the Eucharist. Yeah. St. Jose Maria describes how he would typically celebrate Mass at noon and his whole morning would be spent preparing and thinking about that and the whole afternoon Afterwards, yeah. giving thanks yeah. for yeah. it yeah. and many other saints as well. Yeah, and, and to go back to, the, and you just used the word giving thanks, uh, and, and I've spoke about this before, but it's just something that I think is so beautiful is the word itself, Eucharistia, means Thanksgiving. And, and this thought that there was going to be a day in our life that we were really wanted to say thank you to the Lord. I mean, I remember when my father had surgery, he had a, a heart surgery, and the doctor came and he literally had my father's heart in his <laughs> hand. And I wanted to thank him for that, you know, thank you. And it seemed so inadequate, like thank you, infinity. My suspicion is, is that uh, hopefully, my hope is you, my, and everyone who's watching, has had that experience where they just wanted to say thank you to the Lord for his goodness, for his, for his mercy, for his forgiveness. And this is what the Eucharist is. It is that perfect final thank you that we enter into the thank you of the Father to the Son, and it's enough. Mm -hmm. Nothing else is necessary. No more words are necessary. So beautiful. Amen. Amen. I'll let you pray. You need to take us out of this. In the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, amen. amen. Heavenly Father, we do give you thanks uh, for the salvation that you have accomplished for us through the Lamb of God who takes away our sins by bearing, him, bearing them on his own body <clears throat> and, his own, and in his own spirit on the cross. Lord, uh, we can never say thank you enough uh, for that act of our salvation, uh, but you have given us a way by enabling us to be present to that moment of our Lord's sacrifice and live Eucharistic lives, live lives of thanksgiving, where we stay in communion with that Eucharistic Lord. Lord, uh, through this meditation on the scrolls and these scriptures, help us to have a greater appreciation for what a gift the Eucharist is to us and give us that spirit through the Holy Spirit that is always giving thanks to you. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. And may the Lord bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Amen.